Praise the Lord. I greet you in the name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. This is your program, Living by the Word. And of course, I'm your truly Pastor Eloise Hines of Destiny Empowerment Global Ministries. And it is a privilege to be with you again, to share the Word of God with you. Let's letting you know if you need to contact us. We are at Shaw Park on Sunday mornings from 9 a.m. And we have our Bible study time on Zoom on Tuesdays at 6 p.m. We are going through the book of Ephesians right now, taking our time and going through line upon line and precept upon and precepts. We also have our prayer time on Friday evenings at the Lambo Community Center uh, from about 6.30 p.m. and we have our youth meeting from 5.30 p.m. Amen. So I want to thank God for all of you who continue to stay tuned and who continue to support the work of the Tobago Inspirational um, Network. Amen. So let's pray. Father, we thank you again for another opportunity to share your word to your people. We declare indeed that the entrance of your word gives light, gives understanding to the simple. May that be the reality of those who will hear that they will receive and this word will bring forth a harvest in their lives in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen and amen. I want to continue talking to us about understanding kingdom perspective of prosperity and wealth. And I know when we talk about prosperity and wealth, we normally just think automatically plenty. Amen. Plenty of whatever. Plenty money, plenty material things, plenty resources, abundance. Amen. And while that may be part of our experience in the earth, I want us to understand that kingdom perspective on wealth and prosperity is a bit different. Amen. And I want to recap what I've done so far and then just look at what I want to share today. I want us to understand when John says that um, he wish above all things that we prosper and be in health. The word that he uses there for prosper is not the same word as having riches and abundance and a lot of material things. The word there really speaks about, let me get it for you. The word there really speaks about being on a good journey or to go on a prosperous journey to be on the right profitable path that leads to success it will apply to any plan or purpose that we begin to be engaged in it will include success in your business happiness in domestic relationships or prosperity in any of the engagements and transactions in which a christian might lawfully engage it is the accomplishing of what you undertake to do. So when he says, we wish above all things that you prosper, he's saying, we want you, I am wishing you, I'm declaring over your life that whatever you are putting your hand to do, you will be able to accomplish it. Whatever you set out on this life, this journey called life to accomplish, that is what I'm declaring for you. And I said to you already that when you are on a prosperous path where everything you're putting your hand to do, you're seeing success, I said to you that money is the least of your worries amen the other word that we use or the other text that we normally would look at is uh, psalm 35 27 it says may those shout for joy and rejoice who take delight in my vindication and may they say continually the lord be exalted who delights in the prosperity of his servant and again that word used in this psalm does not talk about accumulation of material things the word used there is shalom Amen. And that word speaks of completeness. It speaks of wholeness. It speaks of peace. It speaks of welfare. So true prosperity has to do with your well-being. It has to do with the completeness of the human, not one part missing. That is what prosperity speaks about in this context. Now, of course, there are other words that speaks about riches and, and wealth and having material stuff. Like the Bible talks about the rich man, yes, and Lazarus. But I'm saying to us, if we look at these two scriptures and believe, well, God want me to prosper, equals God wants me to have just plenty resourceful material things in my hand I'm saying to you that's not what these two verses are saying 
Amen. So kingdom perspective, you need to understand what God really wants. Because really what God wants for us is to be complete and whole in every single area of our lives. And when that is happening, that is what true prosperity is. I said before that some people have money, but socially they, they don't get along with people. They don't talk to people. They don't carry people in their vehicles. Listen, people People can have a lot of money and sometimes emotionally they're bankrupt. Jesus speaks about the man who he had a lot of money and we're going to talk about him. He had his barns, his crops were doing well and he took delight, told his soul to take ease and Jesus said he is a fool because he did not make provision for his soul, eternal destiny. My God. So that's the first thing I want us to understand, that prosperity is not about possessing things. In fact, Jesus said in Luke chapter 12, he says, beware of covetousness because a man's life does not consist in the abundance of things. Life is not measured by how much we own. That's not life. When we come to kingdom living, that's not life. It's not just amassing a set of houses and a set of cars. Even if you do, my God, because some people are awesome investors. My God, your parents may have left some kind of inheritance for you. So you have a lot of material stuff. Jesus is saying, still understand that is not what life is about. I hope you get that. Amen. The second thing I want to say to us about prosperity understands that God owns everything. We like to use the word mine and mine and mine and mine. The Bible tells us, our ah God, in Psalm 24 verse 1, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. He founded it upon the sea. He established it upon the floods. The closest we have to that expression in the English understanding is landlord. He owns it. We get to use it at a cost. Let me say that again. The closest understanding we have of this proprietorship that God is talking about is landlord. Where we know we pay a rent, but the building, the apartment that we occupy is really the landlord's own. And he can decide or she can decide to put you out, to allow you to stay, or decide how they will use and, and articulate the usage of that place. Because they are the owner. We get to use it. The resources in the earth belongs to God. We humans get to use it. Ah, oh my God, David said something very profound in the book of um, Chronicles when they were building the temple. He says, riches and honors and all of that come from you. But he says, but who am I in verse 14? And what is my people that we should be able to will it to offer so willingly after this sort? For all things come of you and of your own hand we given you. He says, oh Lord our God, all this store that we have prepared to build you a house for your holy name comes of your hand and is all thine own. David understood that even though they were able to offer all the things that they possess, it really came from God. So you're giving back to God what belongs to God in the first place. You are being a good steward. My God, and that is what tithing and giving to the church and giving to the work of the Lord is about. I hear people make complaints about, oh, I'm not giving to the church because the pastor want the money. Listen to me, the earth is the Lord's. The money you have that you're keeping back, it belongs to the Lord. You don't own it. But if you want to keep it, then keep it. The earth still belongs to God. What you give to God, the little pittance, even if you give God all the money in the bank, it is what belongs to God that you have an opportunity to say, Father, I'm giving back this portion to the advancement of your work. It all belongs to him. David understood. Now, let me say this to you one time. When you understand that all of it belongs to God, God will have no problem releasing wealth into your hands. 
Let me tell you this. When you lock your hand, if I have this and this is all the money in my hand and I lock my hand and say, this is mine, then keep it. Let's see how long you can keep it because guess what? You will never be able to release, to receive anything else that anybody have for you. My God, because I'm saying to you, the Bible says, give and what happens? It shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed up, shaken together, running over. If you eat your seed, don't expect the harvest. We want wealth, but we want to eat with seed. Or we want to put it in a container home and say, you know what? Afraid, so I'm going to keep my seed. The only way the seed is going to bring back a harvest is when you plant it in soil. When you release it from your hand. Jesus talked about that as well with his death. Come on, a grain of wheat does nothing when it stays. But when it is planted in the ground and dies, that's when it brings forth a harvest. I want to quote Pastor um, Dinoon from Victory Church. When she would take up the offering, she would say, it leaves your hand, it does not leave your life. Who am I talking to? So keep it. But means that you can't give to nobody else and nobody else can give to you. <laughs> Come on, somebody. So it all belongs to God. Um, Timothy, 1 Timothy 6, 7 says, For we brought nothing into this world. It is certain we can carry nothing out. That's the second principle. The third principle is that true wealth and prosperity is being rich towards God. True wealth and prosperity is being rich towards God. Jesus told the rich man, the man who had his barn full and all of that. Jesus told him, he says, in Luke chapter 12, verse 20, God said unto him, thou fool, this night your soul shall be required of you. Then who shall those things be which you have provided? So is he, verse 21, that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. It speaks, therefore, about a priority being placed on our spiritual life, about making spiritual investments. My God, it speaks about storing up treasure that will matter after this life. We store up treasure on the earth. Hear what the Bible says in 1 Timothy 6, verse 17 to 19. As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches. You hear that? The uncertainty of riches, but to set their hope on God. That has been rich towards God. Set your hope on God who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. Do you see where you get everything to enjoy? It's the same thing sometimes, and I'm going back there, that, oh, I am not giving to God. He's, Paul says, God gives you everything to enjoy. If you have it and enjoy it, you, you got to know it's God. Come on, somebody. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share the storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold on that which is truly life. He says, what you got to do, don't hold on to the uncertainty of riches. Hold on to God. God is the one who gives you everything to enjoy. He says, what you ought to do, my brother, who has plenty money. He says, do good. Be rich in good works. That's how you store up treasures for the life after this one. Be generous. Be ready to share the storing up treasures for themselves as a good foundation to the, for the future. So that they may take hold on that which is truly life. Matthew 6, 19 to 21 tells us, Do not lay up for yourself treasures on earth, where moth and rust de destroys, where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. That's why some people cannot sleep when they have money. You know that. That's why they can't sleep when they have money. 
because you're thinking about the stock market you're thinking about what can happen you're thinking about somebody breaking in your house you're thinking about okay what's happening in the bank you're thinking about who can access your credit cards who can steal your cars you are obsessed because that is where your heart is my god sometimes people are so caught up with their riches that they forget god they forget family they just 24 7 day on the work because they are trying to accumulate things that will perish the bible says in james even james chapter 5 verse 1 to 5 he says come now you rich weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you your riches have rotted your garments are moth eaten your gold and silver have corroded and their corrosion will be evidence against you and will eat your flesh like fire you have laid up treasure in the last days the bible warns us even about amassing stuff and just saying hey take your ease the bible warns about the rich man and lazarus my god that he was dear enjoying life and the bible says lazarus died and the rich man also died but in hell he opened his eyes because true riches is about being rich towards God. Build your life. Last week program, if you go back, I talked about Abraham. Abraham, the Bible says, was rich, but he was rich towards God. He was called a friend of God. He had faith in God. He was willing to give up Isaac when God called him and said, give up your son. He had a relationship with God. God had covenant with Abraham and his line, Isaac and Jacob, and through his very lineage is where the Messiah came fought we talk about job the bible says when god took everything allowed the enemy to take everything that job had job did not curse god as his wife suggested why he says the lord gives the lord takes away blessed be the name of the lord and he worshiped god because he had things things did not have him we talk about solomon when God asked him what he wants, he said, God, I want wisdom to rule your people. God said, because you ask for wisdom, I'm giving you wealth and riches. I am saying to us, people of the living God, kingdom perspective is not to amass things. Kingdom perspective is being rich towards God. I say to you, my brother, my sister, if you have money and you don't have eternal life, your money will not make room for you in heaven get to know the lord do not trust the bible says in the uncertainty of riches those things take here and today the stock market crash your whole life gone you're rich towards god you can never be bankrupt in this life or the one to come take my word for it and then i want to say to us my god fourthly god himself is who supplies our needs God himself so our, our, our focus is let me just amass because I need to take care of myself God says listen trust me I can take care of you that's what I want to say to you for the rest of this time trust me I can provide for you listen to me my God let me tell you this I can give you testimonies I went to a program last week. I'm not going to call the name, but I bless God for the, for the family. Amen. Amen. In fact, let me call the name New Testament Church. Amen. In Scarborough, I have Sister Pat and Sister, you know, Sister Janet and all the rest of the ladies. They had a powerful time. And as I was sitting there, I'm talking about how God takes care of your need. I looked at my, my shoe and I said, hey, I need to buy a new pair of black shoes. I said, you know, I need to get myself a pair of black shoes. I am telling you as God is my witness. I walked out the room after I finished ministering to those women. We had a powerful time. Come on, powerful time. I walked out the room and as I walked out the room, a sister came to me. She said, Pastor, what size of shoe do you wear? I said, ah. I said, why are you asking me that? She said, because I sell shoes and God told me to give you one. Listen, I can give you testimonies that God wants to take care of you. He can use people. He can use your hands. He can use your job because your dependence is on God as your source. 
You don't leave God to try to make ends meet and fit God in when God must have first place because all the things we enjoy comes from him. The earth is his. The resources is his. I said to you last week in Deuteronomy, he told the children of Israel when they go into the land, he says, if you will obey me and do what I tell you, this is kingdom perspective of wealth. Don't listen to what other people are saying to you. Just name it and claim it and do this and bring this oil and bring this bottle and God. Listen, I'm telling you what God's word says. God says, if you will obey me and do what I tell you to do, I'm going to give you houses you did not build. I'm going to give you fields you did not plant. I'm going to give you wells you did not dig because you've been obedient to me. Those who have dug it and been disobedient, God says, I'm going to take it from them and give it to you. I can give you testimonies. Supernaturally. Oh my God, I wouldn't have time. God says, number four, the fourth principle, God himself supplies our need. And we are back in Luke chapter 12. Jesus said from verse 22, he said unto his disciples, and I'm saying unto you, therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you will eat, nor for the body, what you will put on. The life is more than meat and the body is more than clothes or raiment. Jesus was saying to him, the kingdom perspective to meet your basic needs is not to worry about it. The expression don't take thought means don't go to pieces. Don't be pulling, pulling your, pull, don't be pulled apart. Like the force exerted by sinful anxiety. He's saying don't worry about it. He told his disciples, your basic needs are God, are considerations of the Father. He says, why worry about something that is not the true essence of your life? He says, life is more than meat and clothes. My God, here's why you should not worry. Verse 24, he says, consider, concentrate, fix your eyes or thinking on the ravens. They neither sow nor reap. They neither have storehouses so they can't treasure up anything. They have no banking system. They have no storehouse nor barn. But Jesus said, God feeds them. How much more are you better than fowls? By reason of your great value to God, Jesus saying, listen, if he can take care of the lesser, he can take care of you. Ah, oh my God. He points out God's ability to care for dumb birds. By reason of your superior work to God, know that God who has proven his care for the lesser can certainly provide for his children. I want you to think about that. They don't have storehouses like the rich man, but the provider of all that is in the storehouse can take care of them. Verse 25 says, and which of you with taking thought can add to his stature one cubit? If you then be not able to do that which is least, why are you taking thought for the less? Worry produces no result in adding one hour to your lifespan. Jesus says that it is a slight thing, but your worry can't improve on it. Don't expect your worrying to effect change in what matters. He said, listen, you can't worry and make one minute add to your life. He's showing us the fruitfulness of worrying and worrying and worrying and worrying. That's why the Bible says, be anxious for nothing but in everything with prayer, supplication, and thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God that passes all understanding is going to guard our hearts and minds. Hear what he says in verse 27. Consider the lilies, how they grow. They toil not, they spin not. And yet I say unto you that Solomon that we spoke about in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. If then God so clothed the grass, which is today in the field and tomorrow is cast into the oven, how much more will he clothe you? He says, oh, you of little faith. And I'm saying to us, if God can take care of temporary plants, 
with a limited lifespan. What about his children? The problem with us, Jesus said, is that we have no faith. We don't trust God. We don't believe God. The children of Israel, they had to trust God every day for their supply because there was no grocery in the wilderness. There was no bank in the wilderness. There was no market in the wilderness. My God, they couldn't stop and plant seed and wait for it to grow. God had to send manna from heaven every day for them and quail. And they had to trust God. The Bible says when they took more than was their supply because they were afraid of what will happen the next day, it rotted except when they took it for the Sabbath. They had to trust God. That's why Jesus, Jesus taught his disciples to pray. He said, Father, give us this day our daily bread. Give me what I need today for my sustenance. He says, oh, you have little faith. Is it possible that God is still saying to us in this modern capitalist society, trust me, I can provide for you. I am still able to supply all of your needs. Is it that God is still saying to his children, your, your daddy is still able, your daddy can take care of you? Is it that God is still staying as much as you look at the economy and the government is saying they can't this, they can't increase wages, they can't this, they can't. Is it that God is saying to his children who are part of his kingdom, trust me? Oh my God. We have become so independent and self-seeking that we no longer look to God to do for us what we believe we can do for ourselves. Father, forgive us. And Jesus goes on to tell him. He says, and seek not you what you shall eat, what you shall drink, neither be of a doubtful mind. For all these things do the nations of the world seek after. And your father knows that you have need of these things. My God, isn't that powerful? He says the nations of the world are running after these things. But God says, I know you need them. His knowledge is not just head knowledge. His, his, the consciousness of his knowledge means he's able to do something about what he knows. Hey, hallelujah. He says in verse 31, but rather seek you the kingdom of God and all these things shall be added unto you. That's what he says. People of the living God, God's perspective of kingdom wealth is where we trust him to be our source our provider and where we put his business first if you ever hear me speak anywhere you would always hear me introduce myself by saying when you put God first you don't come last I have been living by that motto for most of my adult Christian life I've been proving this God that he is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we can ask think or imagine and when we trust this God he does not disappoint he may come in when you think it's late my God but I'm telling you God is still able trust him have faith in him believe ask and see God work in your life to meet those needs this is all the time we have for living by the word I want to encourage you to learn the word to love the word to live the word till next time stay strong God bless you bye bye